So we left off last time talking about uh, shear stress, is that right? But maybe before we get started, we'll recap the equations that we have used. Remember that our average normal stress sigma was equal to force divided by area. That our strain, epsilon, is equal to delta over L. We related those two with uh, Hooke's law that uh, sigma is equal to Young's modulus times the strain epsilon. Uh, we had uh, Poisson's ratio that uh, minus epsilon lateral over epsilon axial. What else did we have? I think we got to talking about shear. The shear stress tau was equal to the force divided by the area. I think this force up here, we actually use the symbol P on. That's fine. It doesn't matter whatever you want to call the force. It's always about finding the force and finding the area. Then we had that uh, the uh, shear strain gamma was related to the shear stress tau with the shear modulus elasticity G. And we had that the shear modulus elasticity G could be computed. And we'll derive this in weeks to come. But it's Young's modulus uh, divided by 2 times the quantity 1 plus Poisson's ratio. Okay. I think that's what we had. And I would, again, encourage you to, when you sit down and do these problems, write it out. It makes a nice little cheat sheet as you go through the problems. And it also uh, continues to, to put those in your mind. This one? Well, one is normal stress that would be uh, tension or compression stress, and one is a shear stress like you might have in an adhesive or something like that. So it's, again, probably going to have a different force in a different area that it's acting over. Same units, similar equations. Other questions? Well, we left off talking about uh, shear, and I wanted to look at some uh, common situations for shear. Sometimes we'll have things that uh, we call are acting in double shear. So if we look at an example of double shear, it might be something that looks a bit like a, a clevis. And we have something in it here. And we might be pulling these apart with some force F. And we have some pin that we've put in here. A little bit like a hitch on some uh, tractor or something. Okay, And if we look at how this is, is going to uh, fail, if we look at that pin in failure, so let me draw the pin before failure. We would just have a, a pin there. And if the uh, pin fails, what's it going to look like? Probably something like this. Does that make sense? Okay. So if I talk about the uh, shear stress that's there, what am I going to have? I can have that the shear stress tau is equal to the force, the force that we have there, the force that I've given there, divided by what area does it have to be? It's going to be 2 times the area, where the area is the cross-section area of that pin. Whatever that pin might be, maybe I'll put that in quotes, bolt, pin, whatever you have in there. Okay, So that's one that comes up quite a bit, double shear. Another one that comes up is single shear. So single shear is going to look like this. And single shear is probably not as good because uh, it... it introduces a moment into it because it's not symmetrical. We're not going to worry too much about that. But if I take and I put, again, put this pin in here. What's that pin going to look like? Well, before it fails, it'll look like this. And after it fails, It'll look like that, won't it? 
And we could say that the shear stress here, tau, is equal to the force divided by what? 1 times A, the force divided by A, where again A is the cross-section of that pin. Well, we could keep writing equations if we wanted to uh, all term long and talk about triple shear and quadruple shear and whatnot. But uh, the, the simple fact is it's just a matter of either reducing the force. I mean, you could say each one of these surfaces had to support F over 2, and that would make sense in that equation. Or you can just uh, multiply by the number of surfaces that has to be sheared through. And I think sometimes looking at the problem and envisioning how that pin might fail is a good way to go through this. Uh, you probably all had some experience with bike chains and whatnot. So if we look at a, a typical bike chain, we would have the outside link here, and then we've got the inside link, and the outside link, and the inside link. I guess I could keep going on this too, right? We've got pins that go through that, right? So on your typical bicycle chain, what uh, kind of shear is that in? Double shear, because it would have to fail in here and it would have to fail in there, wouldn't it? Now maybe you've seen a, a chain that looks like a real serious bicycle chain, maybe something that you know Arnold Schwarzenegger would have on his bicycle or something. Uh, a lot of times you see them on forklifts, the lifting mechanisms on forklifts and whatnot, and they'll have a chain that looks like this. And it will real the links won't look much heavier than your bicycle chain, and they'll be lifting things that are thousands of pounds. But when we look at how that is built. Have you seen that? If you look at a timing chain in an automobile, sometimes you'll see the same thing. Okay, that's usually under tremendous load. But then we've got the pin that goes through here and the pin that goes through there, the pin that goes through there. How many shear is that under? Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So whatever force we're looking at in that, which might be tremendous, we get to divide by ten when we talk about the force trying to shear through that pin. So increasing this is, is good. Uh, those of you that like to design suspensions and whatnot, usually we try and not have single shear in our suspensions, uh, our suspension connections. We like double shear in our suspension connections because we can get away with smaller fasteners and whatnot, have larger factors of safety. Also, as this starts to, uh, you know, if this were a, a nut on this thing here, as that nut gets loose, we're going to have quite a bit of play in that thing, whereas this one really doesn't, the term doesn't uh, rely on how tight the fastener is, right? You could really just have a, a pin through here and put a cotter key or a piece of wire through that or something like that. So single shear, double shear, basically you're looking at how many surfaces does it have to shear through. Well, let's try an example uh, then. Maybe I'll start with a clean piece of paper. So let's say I'm going to take some uh, two by fours. And we're going to glue them up. So we'll say this is fixed and this is fixed. These are all two by fours, and that's uh, typical. OK, and we've got glue in here. So we've glued this joint and we've glued that joint and we're putting 3,000 pounds onto this. And we're told that tau allowable, max allowable for the glue is equal to 80 PSI. Okay. And the, uh, we're told that this dimension is uh, 6 inches, and we're asked, will it hold? Okay. Well, let's see. What equation are we going to use? We're going to use the shear stress tau, that being the glue this time. Uh, and we haven't talked about the shear stress in the wood. No one's told us about the shear stress in the wood. We'll get to that in good time later on in the term. Uh, we'll just concentrate on the glue here, but certainly prudent engineering would, would make us not only look at the glue, but the wood itself. So we've got the uh, shear stress is equal to the force divided by the area. So we can say 
that uh, maybe I'll go ahead and calculate what the shear stress is and compare it to this 80. The shear stress that I would have, I would have 3,000 pounds, right? <laughs> That's the force. And I'm going to divide by the area. Well, let's see, if this is 6 inches, and I guess I better tell you that uh, this is inch and a half, right? If that's a 2 by 4, and we'll say that this is typical dimension also. So in and out of the paper, in and out of the board, what's the dimension? 3 and a half. Okay, good. So I have the interface, for instance, this interface right here, that's going to be an area that is 6 inches by what? 3 and a half inches? And how many of those do I have? I have this one here, and I have that one there. So I'd multiply this by 2. So this is actually a example of double shear, isn't it? Doesn't look like maybe what the mechanicals would think about double shear, but this is certainly an example of double shear because I have two of those surfaces. And if you want to divide this 3,000 by 2, that's fine. Same math. So what do we have here? Seventy one point four PSI. Anyone get that? Yeah. So are we good to go? Yeah. So seventy one point four is less than eighty, so we're okay. We'd need to obviously check the wood. We'd probably want to check the connection with this uh, fixed point and whatnot. But as far as that glue goes, we're good. Uh, and usually you might say, well, this seems like a fairly low number. Well, when we talk about the maximum allowable, that's probably not the maximum. There's going to be a safety factor in there to deal with poor fit up and glue that's maybe a little old and wood that's maybe a little wet and things like that. Um, so I think we're okay with that. Questions with that? So good use of that equation. Everyone's good? Yes, oops. The white rectangle, oh here? Well this is these are pieces of two by four, the grain's going like this. <coughs> like that. So I I'm putting them together like that. We get into this a lot when we start to build trusses and whatnot. If you think about uh, how a gusset is glued onto the side of a truss, it's a very similar situation to this. Yes? They don't, they don't like to do that because that uh, turns something that you might buy for a, uh, a hobby that I can produce and sell to you to something that I take on a lot more liability with. So the, the glue you get down, go down to build your model plane is probably not going to say that. The glue that you go to, to build trusses with or build real airplanes with, then they're going to get involved with that, and it's going to be a lot more expensive because yeah, they put have to put down a number they've got to stand behind. Yes? I'm sorry? I don't know. We would need to check whether the glue would fail before the wood would. Uh, I don't have the wood numbers here, so we're, we're, we're crawling before we're running. We'll talk about shear and wood. Uh, shear and wood usually is not that high, usually about 90 PSI, so it's a toss-up. Yes? This 80 PSI, is that the same value for single shear? Uh, yes, it would. It is. So on one surface, it's 80 PSI, but on two surfaces, it's still just 80 PSI. Because it's, remember, PSI is... Um, pounds per square inch. So with double shear, we're just giving more square inches. <clears throat> All good questions. We good to move on? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, we'd be way past. This would be a bad design in single shear. Other questions? Let's try another problem where we get to do some calculations here. Go back and pick up some of our other equations. So let's say that we uh, build something like this. We're going to take a, a plate and we're going to uh, drill a hole in it. Sorry to the manufacturing people. Uh, you know, there's what punching, that'd be the cheapest. And there's drilling and boring. Uh, what's the difference between boring and drilling? Be a lot more accurate hole with boring, right? 
Okay, drilling, you don't get a very round or, or accurate hole. So you're usually going to drill a much smaller hole and then you'll bore it out to size. If you don't really care, just punch the thing. It's way faster. So um, we're going to take something like this. We're going to say that this dimension here is, well, what was your trivia question from last time? 3M. Anyone look that up? Yeah, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company, right? So you're all that much smarter. That's great. Okay, so this hole that we're going to put in here is a uh, one inch diameter, and we're going to apply uh, 2,000 pounds to this thing. And the way this hole works is if this is a, uh, let's say, top view, if I look at the side of this thing, we'll take this thing and we'll have a pin in here where that hole is and the end of that will be fixed like that so it's a one inch diameter pin okay and again my apologies to the uh, you know the people from tolerancing because you're really not going to want to try and put a one inch diameter pin into a one inch hole uh, but anyway we'll say this is one half of an inch and again we've got this uh, 2,000 pounds there. I've just looked at that twice. There are not two 2,000 pound forces. And I want to ask a variety of questions. Um, if I say that this is the, let's say, B, B section, and maybe that this is the AA section, I could ask, what's the, um, well, maybe I won't. I'll do the, the pin first. I'm going to say, what's the shear stress in the pin? Okay, what's the shear stress in the pin? Well, of course, shear stress tau is equal to force divided by area. That's always true. So what force are we going to have? 2,000 pounds, right? Divided by what area? Is that pin in single shear or double shear? Double shear. So whatever area I get for the cross section of that pin, I'm going to multiply by 2. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to have pi times the diameter. We said it was a 1 inch diameter. So I'll just take 1. I will square that. Divide that whole thing by 4. Because if I use the diameter rather than the radius, I have to do that. That gives me inches squared, right? So when I run through that, I come up with uh, 1273 PSI. So I got a uh, little too many significant figures there, but you now you know where it comes from. Yeah, so that's the shear stress in the pin. Obviously not a real high shear stress for something like metal, but I don't know what, it, what it's necessarily made out of. And we're going to talk about why you might use an oversized pin in a little bit. Um, I guess we could ask, what's the shear strain in the pin? Okay, and remember we wrote out all our equations, so we're looking for gamma, right? Now let's see, what related gamma? We had this nice equation where we could say that uh, the shear stress tau was equal to gamma divided by, no, gamma times, I guess I'm going to have to have the eraser here, aren't I? I'm going to have to have the shear modulus of elasticity, G, times Gamma. Was that one of our equations we started with? I think it was. So I could say then that gamma is equal to tau divided by g. So let's say that it, um, let's say that the pin is steel. So we could say if the uh, pin is steel. I could say that G could be calculated as E divided by 2 times the quantity 1 plus Poisson's ratio. So we'll take this as about uh, 30 times 10 to the 6, 30 million PSI. 
I'm going to divide this by 2 times 1 plus Poisson's ratio. Poisson's ratio is usually about 0.3, so we'll just take that at 0.3. And this turns out pretty close to about 11.8 um, times 10 to the 6 PSI, or sometimes we'd call it uh, 11,800 KSI. So the reason for doing this now is I can say then that gamma is equal to tau. We had a number for tau. That was that 1273 that we got above in PSI. And I have to divide this by 11.8 times 10 to the 6 PSI. If I had this in KSI, I'd have to get consistent units. So I've got it in PSI, so I should be good to go, which uh, gives us, let me double check this. Yeah, 1.08 times 10 to the, let's see, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, 1.08 times 10 to the minus 4. Anyone else get that? Yeah. Okay. So that's radians. Uh, maybe I'll borrow a little room over here. I could uh, take this uh, 1.08 times 10 to the minus 4. That's radians. And if I multiply it by 180 degrees over 2 pi radians, or, or, uh, or pi radians, so it's uh, 360 degrees is uh, 2 pi radians. So I'm multiplying by 180 over pi. We come up with about uh, 0 0.0062 degrees, which makes sense because we would expect if we were to look at a small element in that pin, if we were to go on there and look at a small element, that that element is not going to rack over very much, Okay, particularly at those very low stress levels. So I think we're good. That's a, a good number for gamma. Well, this is a uh, good problem, so let's keep asking questions. What uh, so we could say what's the uh, average normal stress in section A A average normal stress in section a, A. Well, what's the equation for average normal stress? Did we have that one? Yeah, average normal stress sigma is equal to force P divided by A. So if we're in the AA section, what's the cross section of AA look like? It's going to be three inches by a half inch, isn't it? We get some half inch plate. So I could say the force is 2,000 pounds divided by the area, which is three times a half inches squared. So that turns out to be 1333. Again, I have too many significant figures, but uh, PSI. So fairly low stress value there. But what if we ask the same question, average normal stress in section 
BB this time. Okay. So what's section BB look like? That's the one with the hole in it, right? So it's going to look something like this. Again, we have uh, three inches there and a half inch there, but you got this hole going down through it. What was the diameter of the hole? One inch diameter. So if we again just go back to our equation, force over area, and like you started to see, it's easy to say the equation is force over area, so now tell me what is the force and what's the area? That's where you have to do the work. Well, the force here is pretty easy, 2,000 pounds. Then the area is going to be what? 3 minus 1 times a half, right? Inches squared, which gives me 2,000 PSI. Okay. Now, uh, it's probably worth talking about at this point. We really uh, are concentrating on this word average here because the stress value is probably much higher at that hole than that. Okay. Here, it's probably pretty good. This value I can trust quite a bit. This value here, eh, I'm not completely sure about that. So that uh, brings us to the notion of stress concentration. We're not going to go too far into uh, this subject because if you go very far into it nowadays, you're probably going to be uh, using a finite element tool, a computer tool. A lot of your uh, CAD programs and uh, design and drafting software have some of those tools on board. Uh, but I wanted to talk about um, how we could do this uh, in a, a, a little simpler sense. Your author has some tables for some uh, very common geometry geometry with stress concentrations and I wanted to uh, address that in this problem so uh, your author doesn't have this particular table but you could go to a handbook and uh, uh, try and find a table like this and in our scenario there's two scenarios here you see there's uh, two lines two curves on this uh, graph one is a pin loaded hole which is what we have and the other is no load in the uh, the hole so someone drills an extra hole or there's a uh, extra hole that's been punched uh, for a universal fit or something like that well this is uh, not not the uh, one that we have we have this one up here and what we do is uh, looking at the geometry here the uh, width which is uh, B I believe our B is equal to three inches and then the diameter of the hole that's uh, one inch so our ratio of B excuse me, uh, D over B is going to be equal to a third, which um, I'll take as pretty close to 0 0.3. So I'm going to enter the table at this point. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to use uh, this one because I've got the pin loaded hole and that allows me then to come over here and I'll say that I have a value of about 3.5 okay so we can say then that our stress concentration factor K that we're going to multiply our average stress by that our K is equal to 3.5 I take 2000 and I multiply that by the stress concentration factor which I said was about three and a half it's actually a little more than that so we're going to come up with what 7,000 PSI. Okay, so if I were to draw the stresses uh, around that hole, when we talk about average stresses around that hole, we might think that those stresses look something like that. When in real life the stresses around that hole are going to be much greater at the hole and then drop off. Okay, so this is this is what you have going on. So if we start getting uh, near the ends of things, if we start getting around transitions in geometry, you can get some stress concentrations. Okay, you've all used that if you ever tore off a piece of paper towel or toilet paper or something. You know about stress concentrations. The first perforations in it get those stress concentrations. Um, it, it can stress concentrations can be very problematic. Uh, for instance, what the paper towel or toilet paper doesn't always tear where it's supposed to, right? That's probably a small problem. But uh, let's say that we've welded something up. 
So we had the welders come in. They, they V-notched this thing out. And they put uh, welds in there. They did a great job. They got up to do their cover pass. And they uh, <laughs> undercut on their cover pass. So they didn't hold the electrode just right. Uh, they maybe had a little too much heat. It's Friday afternoon. They were in a hurry to get going. And they undercut that right there. Okay. And, you know, the foreman, they went out of there. They, they, uh, it's good enough. You know, the design says that I only need uh, maybe this much thickness. So I still have that much thickness, right? Yeah, but I don't care because you got what? You got a stress concentration, and no matter how thick this is, that stress concentration will start a crack that goes through there. So there's some welding that you uh, do if you look at dynamically loaded structures. You're, not, you're about zero uh, undercutting on your welds. So that's going to be a big deal. Uh, one of the worst defects you can have is an undercutting on a weld. And and the, the the point that I want to make there is even if this even if the remaining thickness seems like it's thick enough for the design, the stress concentration is going to start a crack. So that can be a real problem. Uh, let's see if we run back to this problem. I might ask one more question. Where was that problem? Did I have that here somewhere? We might ask, what is the bearing stress? So this is a bit of a side. Okay, what's the bearing stress on the, the pin or the hole? And I guess we haven't talked about bearing stress yet, so maybe we uh, should uh, talk about that. We could say sigma sub b, that's sometimes what we call bearing. And guess what it is? Force divided by area. Force divided by area. So bearing stress is pretty simple. The civil engineers will use it a lot. If you have, let's say, a, a concrete footing here, And you maybe have a uh, wood or steel column coming down onto that footing. Okay. And you have some weight here. And maybe you've got some, we'll say this is weight one. We'll say this is weight two of the, uh, the, the footing. If we look at our bearing here, sigma sub bearing, that's going to be equal to weight one divided by that uh, small area, right? Okay, if it's a six by six post, it'd be five, five and a half by five and a half, right? Then what's the uh, bearing here with the soil? We not only have to worry about the post or the column punching through the concrete uh, footing, cracking the concrete footing, causing failure there, but we have to worry about the footing pushing into the soil, right? Have you ever been out in the mud and you sink down in the mud? What happened with your, uh, your shoe or your boot? Soil failed in bearing underneath your foot, right? Okay, maybe you've had the unfortunate incident, had to change a tire on a uh, muddy road or something, and what happens to the jack? Pushes down into the mud, right? The base of the jack failed in bearing. So here, if we look at sigma sub bearing, we're going to have what? W1 plus, we better include the weight of the footing, W2, and what are we going to divide by? We're going to divide by that great big area of that footing, right? Yeah which makes sense because probably the interface here of this concrete is able to take a lot more force than the interface with some old nasty wet clay we might have around here. Okay. So now we go back, uh, we go from civil back into our mechanical and we look at what's the uh, bearing on this, this pin or this hole. Well, we've got sigma sub bearing is equal to force over area. So our force was go back to and visit this problem, our force is 2,000 pounds, right? And then we had a one inch pin. So if I look at the uh, bearing on that, I'm going to say that that area is equal to the half inch, as that's the thickness of the plate, times the one inch, that being the diameter, right? Okay. So what's that turn out to be? 
4,000 PSI. So we're going to look at this area. This area turns out to be this rectangular shape. That's the thickness of the plate, that half inch, and the width of the bolt or the diameter of the bolt, that one inch. And you've all seen maybe a, uh, a hole or something that starts to fail in bearing. Over time, you'll have this uh, hole and it will start to look like what? Start to pull out like that, right? Start to egg out like that? Yeah. And that's why a lot of times we'll end up with a pin that seems way too large. If you're going to make some connection in wood, you end up with a, you know, maybe a one inch diameter bolt for that connection in wood. And you think, well, the two by four is going to break a long time before that one inch bolt breaks. Well, that's probably true. What did they design the bolt for, the, uh, the bolt diameter for? Probably for bearing, right? In a practical sense, I mean, you have a tarp uh, and you want to hold it down onto a load. What do you do? Do you just take the corner of the tarp and put a little hole in that and put a piece of twine through it and hope for the best? What's going to happen? It's going to fail in bearing, right? So you might be really fancy and put a nice uh, reinforced section in here and then put a grommet in there. What are you doing? With the reinforcing section, you're making it thicker. You're making that larger. With the grommet, you're making the diameter larger, aren't you? Okay, if you're really in a pinch, what do you do? This is MacGyver 101. You just to grab a little rock and put it in the corner and tie the uh, rope around the rock, right? Yeah, that works really well. So, anyway, bearing, bearing is a huge issue. We haven't talked about it yet. It's pretty easy. Force divided by area. Let's see. Got a couple more things to, to do today before we wrap up. So, let's see, some of the equations that we talked about when we started, we said that uh, normal stress, sigma, is equal to force divided by area. We also said that uh, the uh, strain, epsilon, was equal to uh, delta over L. So if I have something that is maybe that we've put under a... Uh, axial load. So we've applied some uh, load to this thing. It's going to stretch and get longer, isn't it? It's going to get longer by some dimension delta. And maybe I'd like to figure out directly what that delta is. Well, we have a, an equation that unites these two. That is Hooke's law. That uh, sigma is equal to Young's modulus times epsilon. I don't know if any of you have ever thought about, well, what happens if I substitute this into there? and that into there. Probably not too many of you lay awake nights thinking about that. But uh, if I do that, I have P divided by A is equal to Young's modulus times delta over L. And allow me to then solve for delta. I could say that delta is equal to PL over AE. That's going to be a huge equation. And while you might not dream about these things at night, if someone wakes you up in a, uh, from a cold sleep, hopefully you'll be able to mutter. Delta is equal to PL over AE. That's a big equation for us. Okay, that's a big equation. If we look at the units on this thing, what would the units normally be for P? Probably maybe pounds and length, maybe in inches, and A inches squared. And what was E? Pounds per inch squared, PSI. So I get to cancel that with that and that with that and I get inches. So the equation works from a units standpoint. The equation came from Hooke's Law. This is Hooke's Law. And remember we saw Hooke's Law initially in statics where we said that it was force was equal to some spring stiffness times some deflection of that spring, right? Well I submit that this is really the same thing. If I were to arrange this I could say that P was equal to the stiffness value here times the deflection delta. So to make the algebra work, what am I going to have in here? I'm going to say that this is equal to A times E divided by L. Is that right? So if I look at a, a, uh, a spring like this that you're pulling on this, so maybe Maybe we'll talk about a, uh, a climbing rope. Do we have any climbers in here? Mountain climbers? Okay, great. So 
if you got, uh, let's say, 20 feet of rope paid out, are you going to have uh, more bounce if you have 200 feet of rope paid out? You bounce around quite a bit on 200 feet of rope, right? Well, why is that? It's the same rope. It would be the same cross section, but you have a much greater length. So as you increase the length, what happens to the stiffness? It goes down, right? Okay, if you trade your climbing rope in for something that's much larger in diameter, is that rope going to be stiffer? Yeah. Okay, so if we increase the cross-sectional area, if we increase the stiffness of the material, it's going to increase the stiffness of the spring and reduce the deflection. If we increase the length, it's going to increase that deflection and reduce the stiffness. So this is a good equation for us. I wanted to uh, derive that today as we were, uh, as we were finishing up. We will come back next time and uh, look at the implications of that. One thing that I wanted to, to show before we stopped recording and left all together is I always think this is kind of an interesting graph. This is kind of a, you know, FYI. Talks about fatigue. We're not going to talk too much about fatigue in here, but it is something to, to think about. And the notion of a fatigue limit. So here's aluminum. Aluminum actually has no fatigue limit, whereas mild steel does have a fatigue limit. So what that's saying is as long as you keep your stresses under about 40,000 PSI for, for mild steel, you don't have a fatigue limit. You can uh, cycle the load as much as you want and it won't fatigue. Okay, what do we mean by cycling the load? Well, let's take a uh, axle arrangement. Maybe you've got this uh, tire here. And you have, we'll do a semi-floating axle. So you have a uh, outboard bearing here. And then you have an inboard bearing, and then you have the uh, road pushing back on that tire, right? So as this tire goes around, as this rotates, you would uh, initially have compression at the top and tension in the bottom, right? And then when it goes a half revolution, what happens to what was in compression? It goes into tension, right? So you have this oscillation of stress in something like this. If you think about getting in your car and driving across the United States, there is a tremendous... Uh, cycling of stresses in parts on that car. And you might say, well, you know, we're talking about numbers. What is this? 10 to the 6, there's a million. 10 to the uh, 9, that's a, a billion, right? And you may not get that many cycles driving your car across the United States, but if you look at a turbocharger shaft, how fast is the turbocharger uh, shaft running? 50 to 100,000 RPMs? You can start to rack up those kinds of numbers really fast, right? Okay, so it's a good thing that most steel has no fatigue limit. Now, what about aluminum? Aluminum has some cool properties. It doesn't rust. It's light, things like that. But it has no fatigue limit. So no matter how low we keep the stresses, if we have stresses out here, eventually we'll have a fatigue limit. Okay, so the air, next airplane you get into is made out of what? <laughs> aluminum. Yeah, it's made out of aluminum. Okay, do they have a, a cyclic stress? Yeah, you bet. They pressurize the cabin, depressurize the cabin. You go up and have the uh, wings. I mean, not, not that they're flapping like a bird, but they have some cyclic loading in those wings, right? Okay. Um, you go through turbulence and whatnot, so you can get a lot of cyclic loading in those. So that's why airplanes, every so often, they have to bring them in. They have to replace all of the aluminum pieces, all of the rivets. That's why flying gets pretty expensive. So anyway, kind of a, a neat example to finish up our work today with. I guess this would be, I think I'm off on my page numbers. That was six. This must be seven. So I think this is uh, eight. Anyway.